Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Edgar Small. Uh, he will talk about opportunities for sustainable advancement of uh, public infrastructure programs. Uh, Dr. Small has been on the faculty at uh, the American University in Dubai since 2007 with the Department of Civil Engineering. Uh, he, before that, he was with the U.S. Department of Transportation with the Federal Highway Administration in Washington, D.C. Uh, at FHWA, he focused on uh, transportation infrastructure management systems and was responsible for several national level government programs, including the Highway Bridge Program, uh, the Disc Discretionary Bridge Program, and uh, several research uh, programs on bridge management systems. Uh, Dr. Small has brought his passion back to the, to the classroom. Uh, he coordinates the uh, Master of Science in Construction Management program that's been offered at, at the university uh, for a number of years, and he pursues research activities uh, related to construction, infrastructure management, and sustainability. Dr. Small. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here uh, with you today. Uh, as mentioned, uh, I want to talk about uh, the role of public owners uh, and ideas for public owners in uh, uh, sustainable and uh, substantial uh, changes that can be made. So, um, now, uh, I had a great luxury uh, uh, in coming up with this uh, presentation. I knew that I was going to be following your presentation on value engineering. And when I started to think about uh, ideas that, that could make a, a huge difference in what we do, uh, value engineering was one of the first ideas that I came up with. Uh, uh, but since I knew I was following you, I thought I would build upon um, your, your, your presentation. So uh, I, uh, my motivation uh, here is to try to take uh, uh, the field of infrastructure management and uh, the ways that we work in infrastructure management and to um, uh, talk about uh, some ideas of what we can do to make a difference, things that, that perhaps uh, we do not think about uh, in our day-to-day -day, uh, uh, jobs. So um, uh, just to start by setting the stage, uh, for what we're going to talk about. What do we talk about in terms of infrastructure? Infrastructure is a huge area, right? Uh, the first thing that comes to my mind in infrastructure is always roads and bridges, because this is where uh, I've spent my career. Um, but we're talking about everything, all the physical uh, and in, in a generic sense, the organizational structures that uh, go along with those physical uh, entities uh, that are needed for the operation of society and uh, uh, enterprise. That is uh, an Oxford English Dictionary definition. We are uh, involved in providing the basis for enabling society to function. Right? Without the roads, we cannot uh, transport our goods and services. Without the power, uh, we uh, do not have wonderful things like air conditioning. Uh, without uh, telecommunication, our new iPhones don't work uh, uh, as well as they should. Uh, they just become nice paperweights. So our uh, roles, uh, be it uh, as an owner or a consultant or an engineer or whatever it is, is to uh, provide an amazing public service uh, that enables everything else to operate. So uh, the effectiveness of what we do goes way beyond what we see, right? Uh, if you look at studies uh, from the World Bank, right, they correlate directly uh, the effectiveness of infrastructure with the per capita GNP of a nation. Uh, you cannot grow economically without good infrastructure development. Now, uh, we are good at de delivering infrastructure. What I want to do is challenge you with some ideas here that will hopefully make us a little bit better at what we do. So, um, what are we talking about when we uh, think about the owners of infrastructure, right? We immediately think of, of public owners, right? In fact, uh, most infrastructure in the world are owned by public owners or uh, public service agencies. 
Okay, so uh, these are things like RTA uh, and DIWA, uh, but there are some private entities. If they are private entities, they are generally under uh, heavy regulation in how they deliver their, their services. I come from New York. Uh, Consolidated Edison provides the, uh, the power. Uh, the AT&T provides uh, the landlines, um, uh, and these are, are private companies, okay? However, they are not free to operate in the same way as say McDonald's or Starbucks, right? They operate under a different set of rules uh, because they, they are providing that service to society. So um, they will, will uh, be answerable to uh, the public entities in the same way that a public owner will be. So um, to set the stage further for our discussion, how do we fund infrastructure development projects? Where does the money come from? How are they delivered? What are our metrics for success? And then uh, building upon this, this background, which all of us uh, are familiar with, uh, we will start talking about opportunities, okay? So how are projects funded? Right, they are funded very specifically with public funds, okay? Uh, public funds uh, everywhere in the world are limited, okay? There uh, is not an unlimited source of, of funding, okay? Um, uh, so budgets are developed on an annual basis and they are allocated to cover the needs. And then uh, decisions have to be made among those competing needs. Right now here uh, in Dubai, we have a big vision Right? We do not have money, enough money to do everything at one time. You have to choose what you are going to do. You have competing needs. What will be done first? What will be delayed until the future? Okay? Um, as infrastructure matures, those needs increase. Okay? In the West, the problem, in, in the U.S. at least, the problem is not where are we going to build all this new infrastructure. It, the problem is what are we going to do with all the infrastructure that is maturing and needs uh, increasing attention. So um, not only this, uh, we are, our, our focus now on preservation and improvement is further complicated by uh, increasing demands for those monies by other programs. Right. Do you put your money into infrastructure uh, preservation or do you put your money into education or do you put your money into health care? Those needs become increasingly uh, uh, pressing as time goes on. So our goal is in public service uh, and, and especially in infrastructure is to, uh, to be stewards of the monies that are given to us. Right? We, are, we have a source of funds right, that are uh, allocated on an annual basis for us to achieve something. And we want uh, to be the, the best steward of that in increasingly limiting funds uh, as we go along, right? We want to get basically the best bang for the buck, right? We want to get the most that we can get for that budget, okay? So um, uh, we are doing this through programs, and the programs are basically a collection of projects. All right, you have uh, all sorts of different levels that you can look at here. You can look at uh, the, the uh, portfolio of projects. So for instance, uh, you can look at the infrastructure as a whole, then you can get down to uh, uh, agencies, and agencies can have portfolios such as uh, uh, highway construction, and then highway construction can have subsets into programs such as uh, a, a bridge replacement program, which is uh, uh, one of the programs I used to be involved in. The bridge, these programs then are uh, comprised of subsets of projects, okay? Um, the projects are let uh, for uh, not on an annual basis, they are let for uh, the construction cycle, right? And, and often we think about this as the life cycle, uh, but as uh, was just mentioned, uh, we tend to focus very specifically on a very small part of the life cycle, right? That goes beyond uh, a one year cycle, right? So we allocate this money that is, is given on an annual basis to something that takes multiple years to finish. Okay, uh, if we are going to be successful in the program, you have to build then up from the, the project level, have successful projects to build into successful programs, to build into successful portfolios, okay? How uh, are we delivering the projects, right? So we'll look at the project level. Uh, the traditional way of doing this is design, bid, build, uh, where you have the owner going out and giving uh, a contract to a uh, designer. The designer uh, then puts together the contract documents, the, the plans and the specifications. The owner takes these, goes out and gets the, uh, the contractor. 
and uh, awards the contractor, uh, generally upon uh, a low bid criteria, uh, and the contractor runs with the project and builds it. And the consultant then is brought in to, to provide oversight for the owner. If you look at any other paradigms for delivery, such as uh, design build, you are taking these same uh, actions and you are just reorganizing them a little bit in ter terms of who has the, uh, the responsibility. Um, so we can look at it uh, in a similar way. So what is the metrics for success of the, the parties that are involved? One, what is the metric of success for the, uh, the, the designer, okay? Um, how would you say, I have a successful designer? I don't think that question is asked very much. In fact, when I was running programs, nobody asked me that question, okay? Um, be, we go out, we allocate money, uh, and we just assume we're going to get a successful design, but maybe we need to look a little bit further into that. How many uh, uh, design-induced change orders are we getting? Right? Maybe that can be a metric for success. Uh, what about the differential between uh, the quantities and the actuals? Right? There's always a, a BOQ, and if we have a remeasured contract, there's going to be a difference between the BOQ and the actual quantities. Right? What is that difference? All right. uh, if that difference is substantial, that means you're going to run into variations, which are design-induced change orders. Uh, what about the differential in the price between uh, the, the bid prices and the engineer's estimate? Historically, engineer's estimates are wrong, right? uh, on the order of about 20% in many cases. Right? So uh, what is our measure and metric of success? Right? It should be defined in some sort of way that uh, indicates a minimum differential uh, between, uh, say, the, the design and then the, the number of, of change orders or the quantities and the actuals. Now, what about the contractor? What is the metric of success for the contractor? Okay, uh, easy, time, cost, and quality. Okay, so uh, if the contractor brings in the, the, the project under budget, uh, nobody is ever going to complain. Everybody's going to be pretty happy. Okay. If the contractor brings it in uh, under time uh, or, or faster than, than planned, uh, that's a great thing. Okay. But what happens on the other side where they start going over budget and start, start going over time? Well, we add uh, uh, things to try to prevent that, such as uh, uh, penalty clauses and so on. Uh, but this is our, our metric. Okay. So quality is just an assumed metric. You have the plans and the specifications. Uh, you are assuming that you are getting the quality that, it, that is prescribed, okay? And then we try to actively measure the result in terms of time and quality, okay? Maybe that is a metric that can be brought into the, uh, uh, the process of actually awarding the contract to the contractor, okay? Uh, what about the consultant? What does the consultant do? I, I'd be willing to bet that some of you in this room are consultants, okay? So uh, what is the role of the consultant? It is to represent the owner and they are providing a service uh, to ensure the process right, and to assure achievement and goals. They are uh, validating claims, resolving disputes, ensuring quality, keeping on schedule, uh, minimizing adverse cost impacts, uh, ensuring that the owner is getting what they're paying for. Okay, so uh, the metrics here can be similar in terms of a synthesis of the, the, the metrics for, from the, uh, the contractor and the designer. Okay, so uh, what about the program? What is the metric of success of the program? Now, I ran the Highway Bridge program in the U.S. for, uh, I don't know, four or five years, something like that. Um, nobody ever asked me if the program was being successful, right? which to me is astonishing. Right? So uh, I was always asked how, uh, uh, how I did in terms of allocating the money and whether or not the states, I was allocating it fairly to the states. But what's the metric of whether or not that program is successful? Okay, uh, is it the number of projects that are funded? Well, that's, that's a very, very popular thing to point at. Let's, let's, uh, let's increase the number of projects. Well, one way to do that is do things that are smaller. You'll do more projects, okay? Um, what about the area of bridge, uh, 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 deck area that is being replaced, improved, or preserved? Well, that's easy, Make, uh, do bigger projects, okay? Uh, less numbers of larger projects, okay? Safety improvements, reduction of carbon emissions, increased value that is added. Uh, benefits realized within the communities. These are metrics that need to be defined. Now, uh, uh, at this point, I'm still just kind of setting the stage, but I'm bringing up some, some things that we need to think about, right, in terms of how we, we measure the success of what we're doing, okay? So um, what I want to do from here is start thinking about some of the things that we can, uh, that we, 
that greatly influence our success that we probably never think about. Okay, um, value engineering would be the, the first thing that I would have chosen to put here in terms of uh, uh, our ideas because value engineering is very popular uh, and, and incentivized in the construction process, but as we just heard, right, all the decisions are made at that point. The, the real benefit that you can get from value engineering is early in the project life cycle. Okay, so uh, that is a given, and you can show uh, the return on investment is huge. The Federal Highway did a project, uh, a study on this with their projects, and the smallest return on investment was 110 to one. All right, so uh, that is a great. Re nobody else can can show that uh, in their work in terms of uh, the benefits. So I, I, I'm a, a great believer in value engineering. Um, I want to talk about ideas, but I also want to talk about why it's important, and then just. Uh, a little bit about what we can do about it, right? So um, the first thing, productivity, okay? How often do we as infrastructure owners think about productivity? And I don't think it's very often because when I was running programs, I didn't think about it very often. And I think that that's uh, pretty true uh, system-wide. But the, uh, the construction industry and that includes the owners and the designers and the contractors, has an extreme productivity problem, okay? Now, uh, the productivity in construction is stagnant, right? It is not increasing, right? We tend to think that we are getting better at doing the things that we're doing, but we're not in construction. Everybody else is in society. Manufacturing is growing, uh, productivity is growing at about uh, three and a half to four percent. Agriculture growing at about uh, five percent. Construction growing at 0.1%, right? that's basically nothing. Okay? So uh, when you start looking at various metrics, you can actually show that pro real productivity, when you baseline it, is actually going down. What does it mean when productivity is going down in the construction? It means we're getting less for our money. Okay? And if our job as infrastructure owners is to get the biggest bang for the buck, we should be alarmed when we're getting less for our money. Okay, so um, now uh, when we look at productivity, this is uh, measured as the ratio of outputs to inputs. Okay, so if it's going down, we're providing the same number of input, but we're getting less output. Okay, so uh, uh, in terms of contractors, right, productivity is crucial for contractors. Okay, they uh, use it to drive what their, their cost estimates are. They use it to drive what their schedules are. All right, uh, you, you can say, well, all right, uh, we're getting less for our, our uh, money just because we have inflation, okay? Well, yeah, sure, that's part of it. Prices do go up, right? Uh, but as prices go up, right, and competition becomes more prevalent and productivity remains stagnant, it means that uh, uh, profit margins become uh, much more constrained, which means that disputes go up, which means that prices go up, which means that uh, owners are, uh, have even a bigger problem. Okay, uh, so um, this could eventually, in terms of uh, uh, a constrained society, could even lead to contractors uh, actually not choosing to participate in the sector, okay? So, which is never a good thing either. So, from the owner's perspective, right, what is the number, of the, the number of projects that can be performed is a function of the price of the contracts, and productivity is a big part of that, uh, that equation, okay? Uh, as are, you know, supply and demand and, and uh, economic vitality. Um, uh, but uh, why don't we consider, you know, we, we consider inflation, that's easy. Why don't we consider productivity improvements, okay? Uh, I can show that if we make a 5% increase in productivity, uh, you can double profit for a, uh, a contractor. If we eliminate managerial uh, uh, inefficiencies, you can triple profit. All right, what happens if, if we do that? All right? That means that eventually it's going to be filtered down to the owner in terms of lower costs. When you have lower costs in the projects, you have more successful programs because you can do more. Okay? So, um, uh, all right. Uh, I've talked to some people about this, right? uh, some of my colleagues about it, and they say, well, you know, yeah, sure, there's lots of things that we could focus on, but that's really, really way, way down the list, right? We don't really want to focus on that. We can't do anything about that. Contractors don't care about that, okay? So if the contractors don't care about it, why should we care about it, okay? Um, uh, well, I can't answer for why the contractors don't care about it. I think they should care about it because 
uh, the economics really uh, makes sense to, to, to do something in terms of productivity improvement, but we're talking about the owners, right? The owners should care about it because it um, uh, greatly influences uh, the success of the programs, right? Not only that, it is a huge measure, right, in terms of economic vitality of countries, okay? Even though we're not looking at, at, at our productivity and uh, uh, infrastructure development, somebody else's, right, OECD or the World Bank or the IMF, somebody's looking at how well we are doing in terms of our productivity as a metric of economic success, okay? So, um, uh, all right, so we can focus on productivity uh, to be better stewards of our, our programs, uh, to get improved organizational uh, performance and delivery of services, um, and uh, realizing one of the reasons why is it's gonna have a direct effect on our economy. Uh, Paul Krugman, who's, uh, uh, a, a Nobel winning uh, economist says, you know, productivity isn't everything, uh, but in the long run, it's almost everything, okay? So a country's ability to improve its standard of living uh, over time is gonna depend almost entirely on its ability to raise its output per worker, which means it's entirely based upon its ability to increase productivity, okay? And uh, if we're not increasing it in construction, construction is a huge sector of the, the economy here in Dubai. Uh, we're gonna have long-term challenges, okay? Uh, so uh, what can we do? We can modify our construction considerations, maybe start looking at some of the qualifications uh, when we are awarding uh, uh, contracts for uh, both um, uh, design and construction, maybe work on partnering paradigms, try to remove the animosity in the, in the process. Look at input management instead of the output management, all right? So you can perhaps uh, be involved in the process early in the state, or early in, in uh, uh, the process as opposed to waiting for a, a milestone to be missed before we do something about it, okay? Uh, second thing, um, uh, second idea, I wanted to give you three ideas here. Okay, and there's lots more than three ideas, all right? Uh, focus on the life cycle. We just heard about uh, the, the iceberg. Actually, my slides are gonna say that uh, we only focus on half of the picture, but really it's true that we're only focusing on maybe 15%, something like that, where uh, you have this huge additional cost uh, in the iceberg underneath uh, our consideration. So. Um, the vast majority of costs are expended during construction. The vast majority of influence is uh, pre-construction, but we are seldom considering what is happening after the construction uh, is done, okay? Even in our design considerations, okay? Much less in, in terms of awarding the contract. But the life cycle always begins at concept and always goes beyond construction. Okay, it always ends uh, somehow with disposal. And you can, you can Google project life cycle and you will get uh, uh, 20 different permutations from uh, the four step life cycle to the eight step life cycle to the easy 47 step life cycle. Um, uh, they will all start with idea and they will all end with disposal. Okay, so we need to start changing the way that we are making decisions in this project life cycle. All of the influence on what the constructed facility will cost is happening before construction ever occurs. Okay, it's at the beginning. Okay, uh, our philosophy, right, is to try to get the best value for the money, but are we really doing that if we're not considering life cycle costs? Okay, we need to start changing who is involved in what we are doing in these phases. Owners and consultants are generally involved in the, uh, uh, the conceptual planning and the schematic development and then designers come in for, uh, for preliminary design, for final design development of uh, plans and specifications and then contractors uh, really are involved at the end. Uh, sometimes, you know, it might be useful to have uh, contractors with knowledge of how to build things involved early in, in the, uh, the process, okay, uh, to, to be able to, to add some value. So, uh, as, as mentioned, value engineering, increasingly popular in terms of uh, the clauses that we have in uh, our uh, uh, general conditions, be it FIDIC, be it uh, the AIA documents, NSPE, whatever general uh, conditions you're looking at, there's a clause that says, in construction, value incentive is incentivized. 50% share usually between the owner and the contractor. This is where, when it's too late. The significant differences need to be done uh, earlier, as we heard. So uh, our current day decisions all right, right now are also affecting the future costs. Okay? So our, uh, we need to start looking 
beyond our current finish line, which is the end of construction. We're only looking at the tip of the iceberg. We need to look at the entire iceberg, okay? It's kind of like a, a, a runner in a marathon, right? They get halfway and they start celebrating. They're, only, they're not done yet, okay? You gotta keep going, right? So, and we need to do the same thing in terms of life cycle cost analysis as a decision uh, criteria. So we want to consider the impact of current day decisions and a uh, common retort will be, well, it's too complex. Okay, well, I don't think it's too complex. We teach uh, uh, our uh, young engineers uh, engineering economics and they don't seem to have a problem with it, right? So I think we can do it. Um, uh, activity timing uh, doesn't have to be perfect, right? We, uh, as, as engineers, try to think there's too much uncertainty in this. Well, it doesn't have to be perfect. It just needs to be relatively consistent because it is a basis of making a decision of one thing versus another. Okay, uh, we're not making an investment analysis. We're, we're looking at a decision paradigm. So um, you have to be willing to do this in a different way. And then you have to be willing to accept something that is not the lowest cost. Okay, uh, and that willingness uh, in my entire career, we have talked about doing life cycle cost analysis and I still have yet to see it in terms of uh, government programs. Okay, uh, I have uh, about five minutes left, so the last concept uh, is uh, to change the data. Okay, um, in order to make better decisions, you need better data. All right, you cannot, there's so many, uh, uh, proverbs on this, right? You cannot make a decision based on information that you don't have, okay? Uh, we are totally relying upon the data that we have, okay? And where does that data come from? It comes from the construction process, okay? When we are looking at the cost of building something, it comes from the historical information on construction. When we are looking at the payment structure, it's coming from the reports on construction. When we are looking at productivity values, it's coming from the construction site. So how do we uh, document it? We generally document it in terms of progress reports, inspection reports, logs, and so on. And we can get uh, this reflex of getting into uh, 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 paperwork overload, okay? Um, this is not what we want to do. We want good information from paperwork in a better way, okay? Uh, we document what is uh, happening on the job site, uh, document to determine uh, progress payment validity, as a pay basis for variation analysis to support claims, uh, to document uh, successful performance, and so on. So uh, example documents that we have are our plan specs and uh, uh, contract documents, then have to be uh, 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 enhanced with shop drawings and as-built, uh, engineering reports, inspection reports, safety reports, uh, and submittals, okay? Uh, this is, is facilitating the cash flow of our process. And construction is a cash flow uh, business from the owner's perspective and from the contractor's perspective, okay? There's nowhere where if you have a billion dollar project, the owner comes to the table with a billion dollars and gives it to the contractor and says, here's your billion, go and, go and build the project, all right? And there's nowhere that the owner says, all right, build the project and at the end, I'll give you a billion dollars. All right, so it's, it's cash flow, and that cash flow is maintained by and, and facilitated by the documentation. So the challenges that we have uh, is finding and using relevant information. We're not too bad in finding the information that, that deals with the cash flow. That's, that's uh, pretty much right in front, but where's all the other information on productivity? Where's all the other information on successful performance? Uh, and so on. If we have a variation, why is that variation occurring? How could that variation uh, had been prevented. So we want to make sure that we're collecting uh, the right information. We want to make sure that we're doing it in a way that facilitates the use of the information, okay? So um, we need to get out of the existing paradigm that we have. We, I mean, the obvious thing that we can do is try to, to, to do what we're doing right now in a better way, okay? So collect your data in an iPad and do, do it the exact same way. Your form looks exactly the same on the iPad uh, as it does uh, on paper. You're just facilitating, facilitating the, the same process. But we, we should be thinking beyond that. How can we do things differently, right? Now, uh, this slide, uh, you know, can we envision uh, collecting our data and managing our data differently? If you look at this, this slide over here, uh, uh, the one on uh, the bottom left for you, that is a very, very old uh, deck computer, an 8008 computer, all right? So um, who developed that computer? Right, a, a, a group of high school students, and why they developed it was to, to be able to process traffic counts better, okay? Uh, they were told, we don't need to do it different, 
right? We'll just hire more people to count, count the traffic data, okay? So these people went away. They, 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 they left uh, uh, the, the business of working in infrastructure. Now, who were they? Uh, Bill Gates, Paul Allen, and Paul Gilbert, right, when they were 16 years old. Uh, we couldn't envision that we could get a benefit by doing something different, right? Now, should we have listened to Bill Gates? Probably, okay? So, um, uh, obvious way to do, to, to make a benefit, streamline our existing process, okay? Uh, using EFT, maybe, uh, claims for, or for claims uh, uh, verification, virtual modeling, BIM, all these things are talked about, okay? Uh, but what about different uh, paradigms altogether, right? And you'll hear a lot of things uh, uh, being talked about. Big data is something that's talked about all the time. Uh, Google and, and Facebook and these people are collecting uh, enormous amounts of information, okay? Uh, and using it to, to help their decision-making process. What can we learn from them? What can we do? Can we start... Uh, uh, changing the way that we are managing our programs and our, our projects uh, with different types of information, okay? Uh, so my objective, really, uh, was to uh, not show you, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the results of a research study or something like that, but really just to, to give you some things to think about. I hope I've done that. Um, you know, we will have uh, change that will occur in uh, uh, our programs and our processes whether we want it or not, uh, we can either be forced to change or we can be riding the wave, facilitating the change. So um, with that, thank you very much for your time. And, uh...